Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndor and this is what's coming up on the show today. We'll take a look at a story that uh, kept the country talking with allegations of bribery that involves Sunday World journalists and the Minister Gwede Mantashe. Now, the South African National Editors Forum has also weighed in on these shocking allegations, demanding an apology as well as an investigation about the minister. We'll also unpack Africa's uh, media, uh, what's happening, what's the uh, landscape looking like at the moment, and also what lies ahead given the age of 4IR. For our international editor slot, we'll, this morning we'll be taking you to the kingdom of Eswatini. And as usual, we'll be asked, uh, taking you back in history a little later on in the show. And today, we go back to a shocking story of a terror bomb attack uh, right here in South Africa. Can you remember what year that was? All right, so now please don't forget also you can engage with us on social media. Please use the Twitter platform using hashtag SABC Media Monitor. Hashtag SABC Media Monitor. But before we unpack these stories and more, let's first take a look at what's on the front pages of your Sunday newspapers this morning. And we start with the Sunday Times. And uh, after yesterday's World Cup triumph, for most papers today are leading with the green and gold of the Springboks, crowned world champions for the third town time. Uh, Bok captain Sia Kolisi saying that they did it for all the people of South Africa. The City Press has the Springboks as its masthead, but the main story sees the names of ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule and Home Affairs Minister Dr. Aaron Mutswaledi being named in a high profile 5 million rand bribery and murder investigation. The Sunday Independent also in the colours of the victorious national rugby team, but their lead story is what they describe as the dodgy past of SAA technical CEO Adam Foss, who is apparently being probed for an aircraft crash that killed 10 people, including two South Africans in Indonesia in 2011. The Weekend Argus uh, on Sunday is also running the story of uh, this new chief executive of SAA Technical who's allegedly responsible for a fatal helicopter crash that killed 10 people after he ignored aviation safety advice. Apparently, he cut corners to save costs by changing minimum aircrew experience and training requirements at the company that he was working for. Now, the Sunday Tribune pays tribute to the Springboks with the headline, The World's Best Rugby Team. This, of course, after being crowned world champions following their World Cup final win against England in Japan. The story reads, it will be a moment that South Africans will treasure. The sight of our first black captain lifting the Webb Ellis Trophy high as his teammates celebrated around him. The Sunday World continues this week with another instalment of the intriguing love triangle involving Finance Minister Tito Mboweni and Mines and Energy Minister Gwede Mantashe with 26-year-old Lerato Habiba Mahato. Now, Mantashe seems to have backtracked somewhat from his position that he never said that he brought two journalists in a conversation with the Sunday World. He has two versions now. So that's the front pages of the print media. Let's take a look at uh, what's captured your attention on the social media platform Twitter. And a short while ago, these were the top trends. UFC always trending on a Sunday, but uh, that was a short while ago. This has now changed because number three trend, uh, we're sending Glossy, is now number one because he was very negative about the Springbok rugby team and he was saying some things that people saying are dividing the nations. Uh, the number two trend, Springbok champions, of course, Rugby World Cup, and this will be probably trending for a while. And uh, so the Twitter sphere is awash with images of people enjoying themselves, uh, having a good time, and feeling really good about the Springboks winning the World Cup. 
and uh, there were viewing parks across the country where people could uh, savor all of these moments. But inside, that was the site I think that most people are captured by Sia Colisi uh, uh, lifting the Web Ellis Trophy. And uh, there were some pictures, I think, uh, in the changing room. But there you go, um, Springboks done good and you can only imagine what it's going to be like when they come back at the airport and hopefully they'll do a, a parade in the, the major cities with the trophy. Okay, so there's so much to get through on the uh, show and this morning and helping us make sense of these stories are my guest editors. Uh, Shonim Khari, who is a, a media specialist and editor of the Sunday World uh, and, and also the Sunday World editor, Makudu Safara. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Wave. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us on Media Monitor. Right, we begin our discussions with this. The integrity of South African media has uh, been under the spotlight in the past few months. The latest case involves the Mineral Resources and Energy Minister Gwede Mantashe, who initially admitted bribing two Sunday World journalists set to quash a story about him regarding an alleged extramarital relationship with a student. He has since admitted to making the bribery utterances, but has denied actually doing so. Reaction to the saga has been widespread, with the South African National Editors Forum calling for an investigation. The EFF wants Mantasha to step down as uh, both minister and as an MP. Meanwhile, the minister, uh, minister Mantasha's uh, party, the ANC, is standing by their national chairperson. In keeping with its commitment to safeguard the integrity of the media and to defend media freedom, the ANC is heartened by the fact that Comrade Mandashi has assured the nation that he was never involved in such an unethical and criminal conduct with journalists. Bribing journalists is not only criminal and unethical, it is also inconsistent with the values of the African National Congress. The ANC has neither a policy nor culture of buying journalists and strongly associates itself with the latter in spirit expressed in the preamble of the press code of the Press Council of South Africa, affirming that media exists to serve society. Their freedom provides for independent scrutiny of the forces that shape society and is essential to realizing the promise of democracy. It enables citizens to make informed judgments on the issues of the day, a role whose centrality is recognized in the South African Constitution. For the ANC, media freedom and the independence of the media are sacrosanct. All right, so that was Pulema, the uh, national spokesperson of the ANC, speaking to the media earlier this week. Well, for a little bit more on this, uh, uh, these allegations, we're now joined uh, uh, by the editor of the Sunday World, uh, Makudu Safara, and uh, my, uh, my guest editor as well. Um, so this story has just rolled on and rolled on. There's first denials, then uh, backtracking. Take us back to the conversation that you had. How did the bribery issue come about? Because that's not what you were looking for, was it? No, it wasn't. Uh, <coughs> what happened is that there were claims that uh, two ministers, the Minister yeah. of Finance and the Minister of uh, Minerals and Energy, were involved in a relationship with a 26-year-old from Pretoria. Right. And so... Um, the journalist working on the story put a set of questions to both ministers. Uh, the Minister of Finance decided not to respond, um, but the uh, Minister Mantash uh, looked at the questions um, and then in his response said, um, you know, I've paid two of your colleagues, uh, so I'm not paying uh, another amount to get the story to disappear, um, you know. And, okay, so and, he and he said, he that's my response. Okay. Capture it uh, uh, as, uh, as, I've, uh, as I've said it to you. All right. So mm. he was assuming that, that, that there were going to be, someone was trying to get a bribe from yes. him. Yes. All right. So the question now becomes, he has since then said, yes, I did say those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he heard that you have this tape, sue us, we're waiting for you. Um, he says, I, I did not pay the money over, though. What do we make of that? I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it's a grey space because even as we published his claims, 
um, or when I received them, mm -hmm. I then phoned him and said, Minister Mantaj, these are serious claims. I need to fire these people because the Sunday World is not that kind of newspaper. So give me the names. Um, do you have evidence that, you know, these people you have paid? And, and he didn't want to provide those. So even as we published the claims, he didn't provide the evidence. So, you know, and then we mm. decided, listen, we are not going to bury the story because he makes damaging claims against the paper. But we know our story. So if there, there's a need for any investigation, and if anybody at Sunday World is found to have behaved in a particular manner, we need to know who that person mm -hmm. is, and that person must get out of the newsroom. So we're publishing the claims that, that, that he's putting on the table. So we publish the story. And then he issues the midnight statement. Uh, you know, it reminded me of uh, Zuma's midnight yes. cabinet reshuffles. <laughs> but moving right along, he issues that statement. And that statement generated a lot of confusion about whether he's saying we, we didn't, the things that we published he didn't say, putting us uh, on the spot. And I then responded. And in, in, in my response, I say, <coughs> listen, Minister, um, we are quite certain that the things that we published have been captured correctly. You know, it is either you're going to withdraw these claims and acknowledge that you made this, these claims, or you're going to provide us with the names of the people that you paid, and you're going to provide us with the proof that indeed you paid people. And in addition, uh, we will need to establish whether the people who have been paid are related mm. to Sunday World in any way or form. And he, uh, he did the former. Um, he I at a meeting with Sunday. It's not a criminal offense to lie to the media, but to bribe <laughs> is. So, possibly the lesser of the two evils. What do you think is the truth? What's your gut feeling is? You don't have evidence, but from the conversation that you had, what are you instinctively feeling might have happened? I, 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 I don't know. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't want to speculate. Yeah. Um, because then I go into uh, yes. areas that yes. I can't prove. And yeah. you know, in my space, um, I only make the claims that I can back up. Mm. And so when we say, Minister Mantasha said the following to us, we do that without any doubt that should anything happen, should he say anything, should he go to court mm. or to the press on board, we'll be able to uh, provide evidence that indeed well, this is what happened. You know. So yeah. are you ever gonna release this tape? Um, the recording. If if uh, we get to a point where we must, we will. Um, but I mean, um, when I engaged with Mr. Mantashi, I didn't inform him that I'm recording him. Okay. You know. So, um, and I wasn't calling him to interview him for purposes of publication. Right. So, I was calling him to verify the claims okay. that I see in a story submitted right. by a so reporter. So it's only if he so pushes the issue further might you have to defend yourself with this tape otherwise uh, you're not really in a position to mm. release it generally we are, we're consulting with lawyers about okay. what it means and the conditions under which um the tape came into okay. being what are your yeah. staff saying no it's it's been it's been a very difficult week ne? yeah it's i'm mean, not I, I write about that in the in the column today it's been it's been extremely difficult the the reporters were receiving calls from their friends and from their families. Mm. Uh, and is, as you can imagine, you know, you have journalists, this one has bought a house, this one has bought a car, this one is yeah. going on holiday. And now family members are, are wondering, you. Yeah. you, you know? And, and they come to me and they say, Mr. Yeah. Editor, what do we do? Yeah. And I say, no, Mr. Mantasha has not provided substance to his claims. Um, and they say, okay, listen, even, despite what Mr. Mantashe has put on the table. We know he Mantashe is he, but we as people, as human beings, are affected by this. And we know that it's not a requirement that we undergo lie detector tests, but we want to place it on the table as a suggestion to say, you know, just so our readers and uh, people uh, and stakeholders know the kind of people we are. We want to subject ourselves to a polygraph test to, for you and whoever to check whether indeed we have received anything right. from Mr. Mantash. 
you know. And that process, the company that was doing this thing uh, said they could only start on Friday. And, okay. you know, we had a Sunday paper, you know, the deadlines. Yes. And, but we said in spite of the, um, you know, inconveniences that will introduce to, to the production process, we will do it. We will start it on Friday. So we started that process on Friday. It's not complete. There's a, All right. um, you know. So we'll you'll share with us the results. We Shani, will. let me bring you into this because we've just heard now how difficult it's been for the journalists at uh, the Sunday World. Mm. But the media is a soft target at the moment. We've been getting all of this pushback about the credibility of the media. And when a minister of government mm. casts suspicions against a media house, people will tend to believe that straight away. And this is the danger about uh, him admitting that he lied. No, absolutely. And don't forget, not so long ago, during the Zuma presidency, this was the man who was leading the, uh, or rather championing mm. the issue of bringing in a media tribunal. Now, of course, mm. we are under a different mm, yeah. era. And uh, if, you, if you remember from the clip where um, you were interviewing yeah. um, at the ANC uh, spokesperson, it's a t totally different shift, mm. which is very refreshing because had this been, you know, the time of Zuma years, yeah. I think mm. we will be hearing a totally mm. different mm. tune from Lutuli House. And I think it's at least encouraging that they're saying, you know what, we need the media. They recognize the value that mm. the media adds in any democracy, actually in any society. So I'm happy that yeah. um, we're hearing those kind of uh, uh, noises uh, because, yeah, not so long ago, Gwede Mantashi was yeah. saying, you know what, bring us the uh, media tribunal and uh, so we can put a, a closer eye on yeah. how the media goes about reporting, which so is very dangerous. So, Makudu, it is damaging to your reputation because in the world of fake news, all you have mm. is your <coughs> credibility. And mm. this man, by saying that he paid your mm. staff members, mm has damaged your reputation? He has. You know, as you may know, um, there was a meeting between Sanef and the minister. In that meeting, I did make it clear to the minister that in as much as people might believe that we sell newspapers, the thing that we actually really sell is what you're talking about, mm. is the integrity of mm. the news process, is the credibility of the newspaper. It is the reputation that the newspaper is built on when somebody takes out their money to buy, they're saying the things that are contained in this newspaper, I believe, I, mm. I, I have a sense that it's closer to the truth. And what the minister did by making that claim uh, that he is now backtracking on, um, he essentially attempted to kill our newspaper. And which is why uh, when he withdraws the claim as a newspaper, we're saying there's an apology that is due to the newspaper and to the reporters who work for the newspaper. But not only that, but to the entire media industry. Because that damage is not just about, um, you know, Sunday World. It's, mm. oh, the media people get paid, you know. And so he needs to atone. But, you know, another issue, of course, is, you know, if a minister is in office and he says, I paid, I committed a crime, and then he comes back, he says, no, even though I said that, I didn't do it. Yeah. But what I did is that I lied to the reporter and to the editor. Yeah. The issue is, at what point do we believe him? So the next time he talks about, hey, the energy, this in our country. Do we believe him? What informs right. that? So, Shoni, you, reputation management is one of your areas of expertise. <sighs> Can the minister recover from this? Or is the bar slit set so low in our country that we'll laugh it off eventually? Because there are places in the world that this would have been, we take bribery off the table, just lying to the media mm. would be enough to resign. Absolutely. And yes, he can recover, but he's not going to do the things that if I was advising him yeah. or would have said, which is tell the truth, <laughs> tell it fast, yeah. uh, and then start rebuilding your, your reputation uh, from that. But obviously, like you said, in our country, we lie, we cheat, until we're actually f found guilty. Even after yeah. being found guilty in a court of still law, denying. we're still trying, we're denying yeah. and holding on to office. You know, he should by now actually be, you know, beginning the process of, okay, how do I rebuild my reputation? But the bar, as you say, it's so low. Yeah. He won't actually even th think okay. twice about it properly.
my good the final word from you um what's in the paper this week because there's another <laughs> installment <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's a there's a number of things yeah. so we have a we have a spread that that talks about um you know how this uh, yeah, incredible <laughs> uh, young lady uh, could play two cabinet ministers at the same time yeah. uh, how she met them um and there's a, of course, the issue of social media. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, media planners and, and, and people like that encourage um, politicians to, to follow the audiences to social media. But the things that then happen there <laughs> when people slide into the uh, DMs. Yes, um, the direct messages. Yeah, <laughs> that, you know, it then becomes murky. Um, but of course, we also talk about how um, Minister Mantash met Lerato while Lerato was waiting for Minister Mboweni, uh, Mboweni who was running late. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, she's, um, so she's in the lobby waiting for Minister yes. Mboweni. He's yes, running late. Yeah. And then enter Minister Mantasha's stage, right? Yeah, uh, mm. and then there's a, there's a situation. But we also look at the, the politics. I mean, there's been this thing about Minister Mantasha being a tiger, you know, but I don't want to go there. Yes. But politically, uh, Mr. Mantashe becomes, uh, let's introduce another animal, <laughs> an elephant in the room <laughs> for, yes. for the president, yeah. given, you know, the, the factional arrangements right. in the top structures of the ANC, that Mr. Mantashe is a very strong ally of the president. And so uh, how does the president deal with him without weakening himself? Um, right. You know, so, so there's the politics of it all, um, uh, in the mix. Gosh, in the and then there's the poor wives in all of this mm. equation. Gentlemen, we're going to have to yeah. leave it there, unfortunately. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Makuda, I know you have to leave us. Thank you so much indeed thank for you, joining us and uh, giving us a preview of what's in the papers and a, g a bit more background on the story. Thanks so much indeed. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're we going to start exploring the African media landscape. How has it changed over time, and what lies ahead? Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Media Monitor. Now, a private equity fund worth one and a half a billion rand was uh, launched last week and is poised to change the media landscape of the continent. Led by entrepreneur and social activist uh, Dr. Komatsile Mwetse, she says that the Africa Media Fund is but one of many solutions to challenges of connectivity, broadcasting, broadband and practical elements of the fourth industrial revolution. So, change is on the cards, but what is the current state of the media landscape on the continent and what lies ahead, particularly in an age of increased digitalization? Well, a person who understands Africa's media well is the founder and chairman of the APO Group, a media relations consulting firm operating across Africa and the Middle East. Nicola Pompin Monya joins us now from our studios in Cape Town. Nicola, thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Um, so, as you heard you. from the uh, introduction there, there's uh, a private fund that's uh, putting in one and a half billion rand into media across the continent. And I just wonder, is this being over optimistic or is there genuinely value in Africa media at this time? Well, um, the, the announcement of that fund, I actually uh, um, um, read the press release. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it will definitely uh, uh, be part of the solution because, uh, um, in my view, the uh, African media landscape, the pan-African media landscape is, is definitely uh, under, under threat. Um, I, I, will, I will, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Peter, I will uh, answer your question in more detail, but uh, I'd like to uh, take that opportunity, opportunity to congratulate the Springboks, obviously, for that uh, big win. You know that Rugby Africa uh, APO, so the APO group is the uh, main official sponsor of Rugby Africa. So again, uh, congratulations to the Springboks. I spoke with Mark Alexander yesterday, and I had the opportunity to congratulate him. So again, uh, I'm here in South Africa. I'm so happy for for South Africa and rugby.
So coming back to the uh, African media landscape, um, uh, during the last five years, we've seen uh, so many uh, international media investing across the continent. Uh, we know that uh, um, uh, media like BBC has uh, opened uh, uh, their biggest office outside of the UK. They opened that office in Nairobi. 300 journalists have been hired, which is a huge brain drain for the profession. Uh, we know that uh, the Washington Post has announced a few, uh, like a uh, year ago, that they were expanding across, uh, expanding their presence uh, in Africa. We know that uh, French media, like Le Point, Le Monde, La Tribune, opened subsidiaries dedicated to Africa. We know that uh, Euronews uh, launched a TV channel, Africa News. Uh, we know that Al Jazeera uh, just opened uh, uh, headquarters, I mean, office in, uh, in Addis Abeba, and so on and so on. The list is actually uh, uh, quite long of those uh, international media which are um, um, expanding across the continent. Uh, and uh, I think if you connect the dots, uh, uh, we can all understand uh, why uh, suddenly after uh, spending decades uh, undermining Africa and uh, depicting in the world uh, Africa as uh, you know, the hopeless continent, why suddenly uh, those uh, international media come to Africa, invest in Africa. Um, that's because they are following uh, the multinational companies. Uh, as you may know, according to uh, uh, the South African government, there is a bit more than 400 uh, uh, US headquartered company having an office here in South Africa. They used to be uh, uh, happy with their office in South Africa, but now they are expanding, and they are expanding with uh, very ambitious plans. Uh, and of course, those plans come with, uh, with uh, advertising budget and, and public relations budgets. Um, now the problem, the real problem, uh, if you ask me, Peter, is that uh, uh, according to some market research company uh, in country like Nigeria, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, higher middle class is uh, starting to spend more time watching the international media than the local media. And that is a trend I actually see uh, um, everywhere I'm traveling across the continent. Only this year, uh, I travel to uh, probably 10 or 11 continents, and where I'm traveling, I'm always meeting uh, media owners. I was recently with the uh, chairman of the Ethiopia Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I met uh, executive at the uh, RTS, which is a um, um, radio television of Senegal. Uh, I was uh, meeting in Zambia, etc., etc. And, and the trend is there. Uh, uh, clearly, the, uh, the Why African is that, population. Nicola? Why yeah. is that? Why are they opting for international media except, uh, instead of our own? Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's indeed the, 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 the question uh, we need to ask ourselves. And, and um, um, I'm, 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 I'm kind of uh, reaching the conclusion that it has to be, it has to do with uh, uh, the content. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and when, I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm not referring to anything specifically. I mean, is it the technical quality of the content? It is the topic? Uh, is it the way the topic is treated? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very... Uh, it's a very important question. Why are the African uh, kind of di divorcing from their, from their own media? Uh, I'm not sure I have, the, uh, have, the, uh, have the, uh, the perfect answer to that. All right, so one of the things that you do and I I as, a, as a media relations and public relations uh, entity is to feed these uh, news outlets positive news coming out of the continent. So does that mean that they're not taking that information because International media has always been accused of just s telling the negative side of, of Africa. So <coughs> if they're coming in in their numbers, this can't bode well for our image. Well, there is an evolution. I mean, I mean back 10 years ago when I created, uh, 12 years ago when I created APO Group, clearly uh, the narrative uh, uh, about Africa uh, conveyed by the international media was, was mostly bad, all bad. Mm. Uh, we are talking about the economies, the front page, the hopeless continent, etc., etc. And, and uh, if you look at uh, 12 years ago, if you look at the media coverage about Africa, it's definitely 99% uh, uh, about hunger, AIDS, and, and, and you know um, conflicts and stuff. So there is an evolution. Uh, there is an evolution. Uh, uh, more and more international media are spreading good news about the continent. Um, that is not that is not actually fixing the problem because those are still international media telling stories about Africa. My problem is that stories about Africa should come uh, in, a, in, a, in a balanced, in a balanced uh, uh, volume from the African media themselves. So having uh, the international media landscape speaking uh, a little bit uh, 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 better uh, 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 about Africa is okay, it's fine. Uh, but eventually my point is that, uh, um, well, uh, again, uh, here in Cape Town I can, yeah. I can browse uh, 
uh, on, on so many international TV channels, mm -hmm. but if I travel to New York, if I travel to uh, Beijing, how many uh, uh, African media can I, can I sure. actually watch on, on my TV in my hotel? So, um, so again, uh, we are talking about those international media, but really they are national media with international geographical coverage. So it's going better, um, but, uh, but I think it's still, it's still, we're still not there. We're still not there. We, we need to rebalance the share, the share of voice, clearly. And um, if you ask me to be, uh, to be more specific, I will give you uh, one example which uh, uh, in the recent uh, two years showed me uh, how bad this is and how the, uh, that problem is still not fixed. You see, yeah. uh, APO Group is the uh, main official sponsor of World Rugby Association, Rugby Africa, meaning we are in charge of promoting uh, African rugby, not only in Africa, but across the world. We are spending a lot of time and energy uh, to explain the world that uh, there is rugby uh, 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 all over Africa. Uh, not only in South Africa, obviously, which is ah, the champion yeah. of the world, but uh, <clears throat> you need to know that uh, there is rugby in Kenya and Uganda. Actually, back in 2002, there were two federations playing rugby. Now, there are 38. By the way, I'll take a second to mention that uh, this weekend on the 8th in Joburg will be the Africa Rugby 7 with uh, the national 7 team of Uganda, Kenya, Zimbabwe competing for, for rugby fans. Very, and my very point exciting. is, being in, be, being in charge of promoting African rugby, uh, we uh, discussed with uh, the Al Jazeera, the CNN, the uh, New York Times, etc., to, to show them, okay, there is rugby in Africa, there is very interesting stories, human stories to, 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 to tell about, about Africa. Well, while we were uh, uh, pushing as hard as we could to promote African rugby, one thing happened, uh, which was a very um, 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 you know, um, unfortunate uh, thing, is that um, a, a, a um, player from Zimbabwe posted a picture when the Zimbabwean team traveled to Tunisia, and uh, that picture was uh, uh, about the uh, one player or so a few players uh, allegedly sp sleeping in the street because oh, okay. uh, uh, Tunisia did not provide an hotel which was up to standard. Well, that, yeah, you remember that? I will tell you why you remember that, because <clears throat> I am Nicolas Pompignonia, I'm in charge of promoting African rugby, I'm spending money and time, and with that picture, one picture, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that the media coverage generated by that picture will be, was bigger than the media coverage which is going to be generated by South Africa winning the World Cup. Wow. I'm telling you, and I know what I'm talking about, we had three articles from Reuters about that, those, those uh, allegedly players sleeping in the street on, Zim, on, 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 Zim, uh, on, on Tunisia. So, so we had, we had three, article, three article on CNN, you know? So, so the, problem, the problem with the international guys is that they are looking confirmations of what they think. Yeah. So how do we fix this? And um, part of what the Africa Media Fund is going into is infrastructure, connectivity, and I'm talking, I guess, fiber and so on and so forth. Will that help us um, tell our stories and reach further and, and wider? Uh, absolutely. There are, there are several angles. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I started, I stepped down as a CEO uh, a year ago, and I'm now the chairman, and I'm traveling across Africa, and I'm, one of the things I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving conferences. I'm, I'm going to journalism and, and public relations uh, university and schools across Africa. I was in Macquarie University, Addis Ababa University, the SESTI, which is the largest francophone journalism school in Africa, etc. And I gave probably uh, 15 conferences in the last uh, six months. And I'm discussing about that very topic, and, and, and we are discussing about possible solutions. And clearly, clearly, we need to remind that media are companies in a sense that they need to invest, they need to retain talent, they need to be able to pay their talents. Uh, they need to invest in the, the technical, uh, you know, the cameras, et cetera, et cetera. And so they need money. And, and that is why I was so concerned when I saw those uh, 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 markets research establishing that uh, 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 in, in Nigeria, it's already the case, but in all parts of Africa, there is a trend where African uh, 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 citizens are, speaking, uh, are spending more time watching uh, uh, international media than national media, because that means two things. That means that first, Right now, the African media are not in competition with the, uh, the media next door. They are in competition with the CNN, with the BBC, with Al Jazeera. How do you compete with such, a, such, a, uh, such an opponent? And the second thing is that, well, if that trend continues in five years from now, if I am a multinational company and I want to spend ad uh, money for advertisement in, uh, in Ghana, Kenya, and Uganda, am I going to go to the uh, uh, leading TV channel in Kenya, leading TV channel in Ghana, leading TV channel in, in Uganda, or am I going to go to you to, to, to CNN. And as we know, CNN already has six programs dedicated to Africa, and the advertisers are African companies. 
But I predicted yeah. that in a couple of years there will be also multinational companies. All right, and then perhaps a final question about the state of media. And for a long time, our governments, a lot of them, have uh, not opened up the media spaces. Only the public broadcasters were allowed, and it was very controlled. Are you seeing a trend towards a freeing of that space and greater freedoms for the media generally across the continent? Because it is such an important <coughs> aspect of a democracy. Yeah, you see, when you look at media freedom, uh, uh, um, uh, most people assume that uh, Africa is, uh, is uh, one of the bad uh, uh, students in, in, the, in the classroom. You know? When you actually look at the figures, uh, in 2018, uh, there were uh, 56 journalists killed across the world, uh, out of uh, six only were, were in Africa. And, and they were in, in a conflict zone, like Somaliland, uh, Somalia and, and uh, the Central African Republic. So, so uh, uh, what you learn from that is that the, uh, the, the threat against media freedom has evolved. Uh, it's not about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it was, it was about killing and et cetera, et cetera. Right now, the evolution is to be found in the ownership of the media landscape. Uh, the government will own its own media, but the government will use proxy uh, to uh, own and, and influence uh, uh, other media, which allegedly will be private media. Uh, so eventually, uh, uh, that media landscape will not be so, uh, so independent. You have that, uh, that uh, problem, uh, the ownership of the media landscape. You have also the government using, <coughs> government is usually a, a, a big advertiser. So government will also use the, the advertising budget to uh, staff uh, some, some media which are not in line. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and of course, um, um, uh, so, so you see, the, 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 there is different, the, 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 the evolution of the uh, press freedom in Africa is, is evolving a lot. And of course, the main uh, uh, threat against media freedom uh, as a whole, and, and, and that's the main, I think it's the main threat uh, even compared to what I just mentioned, is the fact that uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of countries in Africa, for instance, I was in Uganda, once in Zambia, well, uh, if you are um, a, a journalist, a reporter, you're going to be paid $10 for a story. Yeah. So when you are a journalist and you're paid $10 for a story, well, you need to feed your kids. Yeah. You need to buy them shoes. So if uh, a, a minister or, uh, or a company or a businessman, for that matter, is coming and giving you $50 uh, to write something or to change something or not to write about something or etc. Well, so you need, you see the, the, the biggest threat against the media freedom are still to be found in the finance, in the finance. Right, right. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Okay, Nicola, we're going to have to uh, have another conversation again in the near future. But thank you so much indeed for joining us this day and giving us your insights about uh, uh, media thank across you for the continent. Me, Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that was uh, Nicolas Pompin Monias uh, joining us uh, from our Cape Town studios, giving us an insight on the state of media across the continent. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, after that, we'll have more for you right here on Media Monitor. Welcome back. So a lot's been going on right here at home in South Africa and uh, we're talking about some of those. But here's some stories that have been happening as well during this past week. Now, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg promised a breadth of content on uh, its new news tab on its mobile app. It's already begun testing the feature with 200,000 users in the United States. Now, Facebook News will show a curated feed of news stories from outlets across the country. And according to Zuckerberg, this is going to be the first time ever that there is a dedicated space on the app that's focused on high quality journalism, a feature uh, the social media company is testing, as I said, with 200,000 users in the States. Well, according to Zuckerberg, this is going to be the first time ever that there is this uh, dedicated space uh, on the app that's focused on high quality journalism. 
Now, Destiny and Destiny Man magazines have uh, been relaunched after they ceased publication when businesswoman Kanyidlomo uh, confirmed the closure of her company Ndala Media in December 2018. The publisher, The Bar Group, took over the titles from Ndala Media, which is currently under liquidation. Now, former employees of Ndalo Media say that they have not received salaries uh, promised to them in signed retrenchment packages. So, whilst the titles may be back on the shelves, it does seem that the battle for the former employees is far from over. In a statement, 45 of them are taking further legal action against Glomo, who has allegedly had no contact with her former staff uh, since the closure of her media company. Now, this past week, the media fraternity received the sad news of the passing of veteran broadcaster Tolani Gwala. He lost a brave two-year battle against cancer in the early hours of Friday morning. In tributes that have been paid to him, he's been described as a gentleman, a great broadcaster who was dedicated to his work. The 44-year-old Gwala had a more than two decades long broadcasting career on radio and television. His career started at the SABC's Ukozi FM and at Lotus FM in Durban, leading him to other radio shows, uh, including AM Live on SAFM. On television, he hosted the popular talk show Asukulume, Let's Talk, and the South African version of the international reality program Dragon's Den. Now, Gwala is not only being remembered as a formidable broadcaster, but also as a champion for cancer awareness. The one thing that I think I have learned is just to be grateful. I'm grateful for every day that I have, because you just never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Grateful for family, grateful for friends. Don't worry about what happens next, just be grateful for the now. And I think that's just the most amazing lesson. Yes, may his soul rest in peace. <sighs> yeah, what a really sad story. Uh, great guy, uh, so young. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that's been coming through throughout this week is that he was, he never had a bad thing to say about anybody. And so <laughs> you'll be pushed to find anyone who's got mm -hmm. a bad thing to say about him. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, obviously the newspapers mm -hmm. have been reflecting on his life in the newsroom, mostly and outside the newsroom. Uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, talk about some of the mm. things that are uh, innocuous, but like yeah. uh, the fact that he was uh, uh, tech illiterate, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as an example. Yeah. But uh, on the serious stuff, yeah. I personally enjoyed the way he engaged with uh, uh, the people who were his guests because he was always fair. I felt yeah. he was always fair in his interviews. You have journalists who love to be yeah. labeled flesh-eating journalists and they want to yeah. take you apart and all. <laughs> he will give you an opportunity yeah. to do that. But to the issue that you closed uh, off earlier with was um, his contribution to cancer awareness. You know, this year I recently joined forces with a group of people who are going to be raising awareness around male cancers in particular. Yeah. Because uh, black men, I didn't know this, that apparently black men are more likely to suffer from prostate cancer wow. than white men and it's a it's a it's a genetics thing it's yeah. got nothing to do with um, yeah. diet or and anything like a, that he was a great champion of he was a great champion yeah. of that so right. you invite me here early next year i promise i'll come here wearing a speedo because that's what we'll be <laughs> doing <gonna> to, <laughs> to <laughs> raise Surely awareness we've still got lots to <laughs> chat about but first uh, it's time for us to go back into our archives uh, in uh, in uh, history now today we go back to the 30th of october uh, 2002 south africa was still navigating its way through the early days of democracy and despite what many saw as a miracle transition there were many white right-wing groups that felt alienated and were unhappy about the new order this was at a time when 16 members of the right-wing militant group the Buramah had been put on trial for plotting to overthrow the government well a white supremacist group took action setting off a series of bombs in Soweto this is how the SABC covered the terror attacks Good evening, this is the news at 8. It's been a day of fear, outrage and investigation as the country woke up to the devastation of a string of bomb blasts in Soweto. President Thabo Mbeki claimed it's the work of a handful of people trying to destabilize the country and call for calm. It all happened in the early hours of this morning. A series of blasts began about 11.30 p.m. when police were alerted about two suspicious-looking men at a filling station in Dlamini along the Pochestrom Road. 
Police found an explosive device and defused it. The first explosion was at a mosque in Dlamini. Four blasts followed along a railway line about 400 meters from the new Canada station. A woman was killed when debris hit her shack. There were two explosions on railway lines at the Midway station and two more on lines in Lanasia. A cold, wet Soweto, the damp morning after a night of terror. It all began just before midnight. The first bomb tore apart the Tlamini Mosque. A few minutes later, the night air shattered again. Four more bombs, this time along the new Canada railway lines. Within an hour, four more exploded, two at Midway Railway and two on the tracks at Lanasia. Nine explosions in all. It shocked the country and killed 42-year-old Clorina McCorner. Her 16-year-old daughter Mary was asleep next to her when parts of the railway track smashed through the roof. I hold her here by her heart. Her heart wasn't pity anymore. <laughs> and when it's before, before, get hurt here and he was pleading. Her stepfather escaped with head injuries. As he went into surgery this afternoon, police were intensifying the investigations. While the police are busy here piecing together clues, the ministers are asking the big question why. Security was tight as the ministers cast their eyes over the damage. Yeah, that was an exercise. Anyone who crossed police lines was in trouble, including this Sunday newspaper photographer. As the ministers mulled over what had happened, news came through of another blast in Broncospreit near Pretoria. The police are investigating it. They will report. We don't want to start any, any speculation about it at all. But if it is linked to these, we have said we will react properly to it. The theory on the ground was that the blasts were the work of right-wing groups. We think we know who did this. We think that the people who did this wanted to send a message. In fact, the members of the public who reported the first one which was detonated reported two white men who acted suspiciously, who after they left the, the, the petrol station the police found a bomb. In Cape Town, the president called for calm. This is a, a, a very hopeless venture because absolutely no possibility uh, of, of these extreme right-wing racist groups uh, achieving any of the purposes that they intend. It's, it's not possible. Uh, they will not succeed. There are many questions to be answered tonight. The bombs were made out of ammonium nitrate, an explosive often used in mining. At least one other bomb was diffused. There's a strong theory that many more could be hidden away. If so, where? No one has claimed responsibility, but security forces say they won't rest until they find the guilty. Sandy McCowan, SABC, Soweto. All right, so that's us going back in history, a feature that we'll continue to bring you. And uh, please send us a message and uh, let us know which year you want us to go back in time to and we'll find some stories for you. All right, let's take a look at uh, what's happening in the present moment as we look at our Sunday papers. And I guess most papers, front pages, the green and gold, but you have some other stories within that. Yes, no, absolutely. I yeah. mean, it was all green and gold across the, across yeah. the nation, in, including international papers yeah. um, and uh, broadcasters as well. But uh, what caught my eye, certainly in the business side of the Sunday Times, was the fact that uh, we have still m managed to escape a downgrade mm. yeah. from Moody's to junk status. And uh, I don't know if this is the remnants yeah. of the Ramaphoria that still lingers because yeah. everything else does not suggest that we do, we, you know, we've got the right plans, we're making the, uh, the right noises. But we still to see proper Im implementation mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, budgeting. So I guess the person who's going to be under pressure is Tito Mboweni. He really <laughs> has uh, to deliver. Uh, again, a different kind space. of pressure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 to deliver a budget that actually yeah. says, you know what, this is the path that we're going to follow to make sure that we get ourselves out of this yeah. uh, economic situation. All right. So, you know what, because we're running out of time, the other story I did want to interrogate was what was trending on social media. Mm. So the nation is celebrating uh, the Springboks winning and Mbuiseni uh, Ndlozi, the national spokesperson for the EFF, mm. 
uh, wrote a series of tweets suggesting that you know um, we shouldn't be so excited. He even said to um, uh, uh, to the to the. In fact, the tweets are up there. They mm. said to to blacks. He said, "Congratulations, Sia Colisi. The rest of you, you must go and get your congratulations from uh, Prince Harry." A lot of people upset and saying that he's dividing the nation, he's misreading the mood of the country. Mm. What's your take on, on what he had to say? Well, obviously, I, I expect him to take that line because mm. controversy is kind of the EFF brand of politics, if you like. Mm. And, um, but he definitely misread the, the mood. Um, everywhere you could see on television, people were united, everybody was celebrating. Every, every picture I saw, it was a collection of yeah. black, white, Indian, everybody was together, yeah. you know, in this country and abroad. So for him to come up with that uh, was totally uh, yeah. uh, uh, out of order, I think. And I think what, or, or what we should do is actually ignore him. I think actually we shouldn't be giving him more oxygen right, by, right. By, by, by featuring some of these things because this is not the mood that the yeah. country is currently going through. We are all happy. We are all hoping that this yeah. could be yet another new beginning for yeah. us to come together and uh, you know, um, let go of Especially all these things that divide us. When the captain, when he was in being interviewed, he said that you know, we can achieve so much and do so much if we do it together. together. Yes, you know. So that yeah. is that is the message that is being uh, yeah. uh, 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 pushed forward as a consequence of us winning the, the rugby. That. Uh, you know, let's again rediscover, yeah. uh, you know, how, what we can do when we put, uh, our, when we join right. forces and uh, act as one nation. Shoni, my right. we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. <laughs> run out of time, as we always do. <laughs> but uh, luckily, we'll have you on the program again in the future. Thanks so much indeed for your insights this day. Thank you. Pleasure being here. And you at home, thank you so much for joining us and uh, watching uh, Media Molly. So join us again at the same time for more of the same. Have a great week in between. And uh, yeah, let's welcome the box when they come in and uh, uh, display our flags and be patriotic. Thanks so much indeed, everyone. Have a good week. Bye-bye.